And hello, everybody. Uh, time for another misplaced, uh, because it's the 23rd, not the first Tuesday, New York Review of Science Fiction reading. We are in our 30th season. My name is Jim Freund. With us today will be the wonderful, awesome Karen Russell. This is uh, about the fourth time I'm interviewing her, but the second time with the New York Review of Science Fiction Readings. Her latest book is a collection of novellas and stories called Sleep Donation. And the cover looks like that. Okay, now let's replace that cover with Karen. And Hi, there Karen. we are. Hi guys. Hi, Thanks Hi there, okay. Thanks for having me back. Having you back, it's been how many years? It, you know, we're really um, improving on our, uh, our average. Is, <laughs> I, I can actually, uh, well, yes, if you combine Hour of the Wolf with the reading series. But yeah. as last time you did the reading series, I can tell you, was um, 2008, June 2008. Uh, I have like such fond memories of that evening because we all went out to a pub afterwards. And yes. I remember um, I was uh, kind of walking along, like having this intent conversation with, uh, you know, one of the, the folks who had come out with us and I walked him into a bollard. This was down by South Street Seaport. And I only know that now because later I was like, what was that thing I walked that poor man <laughs> directly into? Um, but it was South Street Seaport feels like the science fictional part of Manhattan to me. It I, did. I honestly was not I had never been there before. I and um I the first time I went down that way was to hear Kelly Link read for your series. Ah, okay. And she, of course, at that time with Gav and Grant was running the other reading series. That's mm -hmm. now Matt Kressel and Ellen Daplow. Mm-hmm. And so they're that also is a, it's like a wonderfully haunted part of the island, right? You know, you're sort of expecting Manhattan to stop. And if you keep moving through those Michael Jackson mists, like, yeah, right. It opens on to, you know, seagulls in the 18th century. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the building that we were in uh, is, uh, a, uh, it was built for the War of 1812. Oh, wow. For building ships. Wow. And after the war, a wing of it was turned into a hotel. And there was a particularly gruesome murder in that oh, hotel. And so when we went in there, um, into the upper space, we were adjacent to the hotel part, which nobody was allowed in because they hadn't shorn up the timber or anything since the 19th century. <laughs> and they just told anybody, don't go in there. It's haunted. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get some kind of street signage for that. You know how they have like the yellow tape and stuff just to <laughs> let people yeah, with know. Little, Unfriendly with ghost. ghost or, yeah, privacy, yeah. please. Unfortunately, the Melville Gallery and the other building on Shermerhorn Street, which is the one we were in, uh, uh, is now gone. Oh. Uh, the, the seaport is mostly gone. It was It was purchased by Hearst Enterprises, and they want to put high-rises there mm. and uh, further destroy the Manhattan skyline, which has been fairly well destroyed over the last seven or eight years anyway. Yeah. You know, it's I, I remember reading this beautiful essay by Colson Whitehead about how you know you're a real New Yorker when all of the ghostly New Yorks are more real to you than what now occupies the present. You know, like that when you have a ghost city and it just feels more true to you than whatever has kind of, um, you know, arisen to cover it up. Yeah. So I feel like I, you only have to live in New York for six months for a, for a new New York to start to surface. Where did you live before you moved to New York? I grew up in Miami. And, you know, Florida is like such a long peninsula that we just never really made it out. I mean, we would like go on road trips and then sink back down and defeat to Miami. So I never, mm -hmm. I mean, I never went to, I'm trying to think if that's, I went to school in Chicago um, to college. So that was like the first time I saw snow 
and all, all of these like milk fed Midwestern kids. And then I went to New York after that. And I was there until 2012. So, yeah. so for about 10 years. And I, miss, I really miss it. I mean, I love Portland a lot, but I will tell you that um, it took me a little while after moving out here to, you know, the pace of New York is so intense. It is, although, um, well, especially during lockdown and out in, uh, Barbara and I are in the southernmost point of Brooklyn. Okay. So it's sort of a suburb. So it's a little quieter. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about Portland. We would go to the downtown in the early, the first year I was here, I was like, did everyone get raptured? Where are all the people? I mean, it just, <laughs> it felt <laughs> terrifying to me, even though it's, you know, it just a kind of was a quiet Saturday night. I'd be like, where is everyone? I, I, probably at the courthouse. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, well, they, it's an amazing, there's ama amazing stuff happening here too. And it is, you know, uh, to see sort of, these crowds that are mobilizing um, and that like kind of the real um, amazing stuff happening, even during this pandemic, you know, they were able to get enough signatures to pass universal pre-K. So sort of boots right. on the ground stuff that's like transformational. Um, and like, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests here were unbelievably moving um, and they continue. But yeah, when I first came here, there were there were fewer crowds and there was more just sort of, my friend was like, what is this? It's the green grave. <laughs> she was a lifelong New Yorker. And yeah. um, you're just in her body, didn't know how to metabolize like a peaceful Sunday as anything but the lull before the storm, you know? Like oh. a terrible foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had our events here, even uh, not that far away from where we live. I'd say two neighborhoods over, but things never caught quite as intense as uh, the police riots, which is the thing to call them yeah. in Portland. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, now you see, you know, Joey Gibson and these, these people, they, they were, you saw how that all played out on January 6th. I mean, we've known for a yeah. while that this is a white nationalist domestic terror organization. So it's now only now, I think people are coming around to that, you know, I mean, there was a lot of texting between the police and the Proud Boys. I mean, it's, if you look at photographs, police have their backs to the Proud Boys and they're facing the protesters. It's pretty, um, pretty horrifying. Yeah, um, yeah, we're, uh, but hopefully we are coming out of the uh, end yeah. of that particular dystopia. I, I feel hopeful. I don't know. I mean, I, I know, you know, the news, <laughs> the news is also very dire at this moment, but there, I think there's signs, signs of hope. Are you feeling that way in, in Brooklyn? Um, I would say yes. Yeah. So, uh, for no other reason than my dad got, he's like you, he's also been double vaccinated. So now he can go to the Costco and just <laughs> fulfill his his confusing <laughs> and, and urgent need to browse the aisles of a Costco without fear. So I'm yeah. happy. I'm happy for that. Yeah. Well, New York is opening up, and here the big political football is uh, is it opening too fast? Yeah. You know, because now all of a sudden there's movie theaters and restaurants. And mm -hmm. from a governor who everybody hated, then started loving because of the way he handled the pandemic. And now he's been making his own headlines. And yeah, so, he, yeah. so he's throwing candy and money to everybody. <laughs> the Stockholm syndrome is wearing off, right? I feel like it's interesting. That's been so interesting to watch that sort of rise and fall where everyone like yeah. woke up collectively and remembered, wait a second. <laughs> You know, this well, everybody ha hated him before. Yeah. But at the beginning, yeah. <coughs> pardon, at the beginning, he did a very good job of the, uh, you know, as far as the uh, pandemic is concerned. And yeah. then all of a sudden it was, let's tell the truth. And, and, oh, this is like between the attorney general and the governor in the last 20 years, about the fourth person who's toxic. 
we had uh, two governors and an attorney general and uh, two attorney generals. Um, come to think of it. Oh, and one who was just running for governor. So I don't know what it is about New York. Right. That, that really corrupts the. <laughs> yeah. Starts absolutely. to grow the soul. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like my, um, my son was looking at this new copy of Sleep Donation. There's a little baby in a helmet on the back that sort of get, the, the dreams are being sucked out of him. And he said, oh, good, you wrote a story about King Baby. And I immediately <laughs> knew King Baby would be a more just, <laughs> yeah. just mom. With that, so we really need to, more babies on AWP panels, you know, more babies in office. Like, I think that's the way forward. And if your kids come back uh, before we're done here, we might have more babies on the uh, You might have some babies the street. on the room. Yeah. He's asking it, hard questions about this reality. I was not prepared. I mean, he's only four, and he's already like, why do we have to die into skeletons, was his most recent question. I said, okay, <laughs> I really can't help you there. Okay. Um, right. You know, he's already vexed. He's already vexed by this sort of, like, permanent, seemingly permanent absence. I just, you know, <laughs> I'm like, these are the right questions, my son. Um so you have two kids now, one four and one one. Yeah, she's I don't I I she's eighteen months. I for some reason can't accept that that's how old she is. Well, she was a, truly a newborn when this started, and now she's yeah, just walking to the fridge, you know, making herself a snack, using language <laughs> willy nilly. Um, yeah, we we have a neighbor who's baby, well, and he's a first responder. Mm -hmm. And he had a baby born in late February of last year. Oof. So she's just about one now. Yeah. And uh, I think mama takes uh, the baby and goes to their parents' house. And he inhabits next door because the first responder and the baby and all that. So hard. That part is so hard, you know, and and you don't get that time back. It's really that. I mean, that that's that is so much more. We we are sort of in such a lucky position to be riding out these storms, but it's still sad, right? Most of my friends haven't met my daughter, you know, and my son now he has an imaginary friend that he also socially distances from. He was on his walkie-talkie with. <laughs> I was like. Give him a hug. <laughs> Give him yeah. imaginary spider guy a hug. It's fine. He was like, no, nah, we're just the same. I was like, oh, no. Keep your pukas at six feet apart. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, I mean, it's getting deep in the weave of these children. You know, <laughs> internalizing something weird. Um, I was telling my husband, it's also hard for us. You know, sometimes my son is, like, very imaginative, and I don't really know what's developmentally appropriate and what's, like, incipient madness brought on by this pandemic that line feels blurry to me and so i was telling my husband i was like he's just over there gibbering in a corner do you think that's normal and then my husband said that's what you do all day that's your whole job <laughs> i was like it's true <laughs> no it's true so let, let's talk a bit about your career now um Oh, thank you for dignifying it with that noun. It feels like you know, no. I mean, now we will see all talk the about the career. <laughs> lots of laundry, lots of like nude cabbage patch kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we first met, and, and and we met because I was doing tech support for your agent. That's right. That's and. Right. Uh, just to make things circular, there was uh, a woman working for your agent, who's still your agent, right, Denise? She is, yeah. Shannon? Yeah, that's right. Yes, Denise Shannon, okay. Um, and she had uh, a relatively new agent there, which is how I met Denise, named Christine Cohen, who I knew because she used to be at the Virginia Kid Agency. But now Christine is back at the Virginia Kid Agency and is now Barbara's agent. Oh, cool. 
our co-agent along Very with uh, cool. Vaughn and Will. It's a small, so. it's a small cosmos we inhabit, right? I mean, are you that it's nice to yeah. be constellated that way? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And at that point, uh, Denise gave me a copy of Help Me with the Full Title, St. Lucy. St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves. It used to be an even longer title. They like it was like St. Agatha's Halfway House for that, you know. So I'm glad that it's it's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, oh, but but such a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just that was your debut, right? Yeah, that was around the time we met. When yes. I taught myself at that time through like the Doppler of aging to be very old, but now I recognize in the rear view that. Uh, that was not the case. <laughs> but, but at that time, the New Yorker called you uh, one of the, was it 25, under 25? I was uh, 20 under 40. And then in New York Magazine, because there were all of these age specific, you know, I think there I was like one of 25 under 26 or something, but I was definitely the oldest one in that group. So it would be like you know, this 12 year old who was on Broadway in The Lion King and, you know, like uh, the Westing, you know, like some scientist who had invented an incubator that like ran on marbles or whatever. And then they were like, what did you do, big one? I was like, I wrote a story about a ghost. And it was a little <laughs> deflating. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Lots well, and not stories about ghosts, but I do just remember realizing that I was like the oldest one in this room of prodigies, all of whom had like these storied accomplishments. And I was like failing to write about ghosts at that time and working as a like a vet tech. So, uh, this is right, <laughs> I remember that, which is uh, the story that you read about that time at uh, uh, when you appeared with Tom Dish was that wonderful story with the horses oh yeah that were all ex-presidents yeah yeah that's right oh what an honor to read with him too i feel like i um that you know that's amazing to have that true memory uh, I'm, yeah. glad, I'm glad to have a witness i'm glad now now i can confirm not a fever dream really happened and and, and that was probably his last public appearance yeah um uh i'll well, well, suffice it to say to everybody, won't go into all the detail, but that was in June mm -hmm. uh, of 2008. And on July 4th of 2008, he uh, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I so, saw him right after that. Do you remember? Like maybe even that night, I think I went. Was I on the hour of the wolf right around then? I remember. Yeah, that's right. You were. Right around then. You were, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, uh, I, th I think I was pretty shocked. Well, you were on Hour of the Wolf a few times. Mm -hmm. And actually waking up at 5 a.m. Or rather waking up <laughs> to be on. Yeah. On no, Friday. yeah, you picked me up. Yeah, like and then in the middle of the night. That that also felt like something That's I would probably right. know. You know? Uh, yeah, was, yeah that, all, that probably is why I'm remembering it as this like Mobius strip of a fever dream kind of an experience. Yeah, so we, um, I, I had, so you were, the, the point is, is that you sort of started out already at, uh, as far as the press was concerned, if not you, at the top of your game. It was a really fluky thing, totally. It was, so the New Yorker published my first published story, but I had had a prose poem that I published with Kelly Link in LCRW. Okay. And that, that, that I count is like my first publication. And like, I have never been happier than I was when I, and this was like old, it was very old fashioned. They mailed me a chocolate bar and like Aww. a card. And that was my payment. <laughs> but anyway, Kelly Link, I just, I, I adored her. And I, you know, I didn't have any personal connection to her. And I just, I loved LCRW. And I was like, these are, these are the freaks I, I feel such a kinship with. Um, and then, you know, it's still, you still kind of get rejected. Like I, there was a long stretch where I, I struggled to figure out what a novel even was. I think that I, I tell my students that because I had this idea that once you were, once somebody shuffled your words into font in a print magazine, I kind of thought, roll credits, you've made it, you know? And of, of course you're always starting from zero again with every yeah. story. 
And it's so uh, obviously your agent was working hard for you because it's very difficult to have your first book be a book of short stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. And and to this day, I mean, I think I think my publisher continues to feel, you know, they just don't sell as well as novels, right? So I have a very supportive publisher. I'm so grateful. But I think, um, you know, I remember George Saunders telling me that his experience was that a story collection to a novel, like a novel got seven times as much attention and sold seven times as well as a yeah. story collection. This was before he, I mean, he might be the lone exception to this. <laughs> uh, is that, has that been true for you now that you have both novels and collections out? Yeah, I would say, of you know, of, of the things I published, Swamplandia has sold like 10 times as well as anything else. Um, but I love stories. I love them, Jim. They make more sense yeah. to me. I love story collections that we were just talking before coming on here, guys, about Aliyah Don Johnson's story collection, Reconstruction. But yeah. it's such a fantastic way to get to know, like, the scope of an imagination, you know? I love novels, too, but sometimes I think I'm such a, I have ADHD, I don't know, like, I want to hop from lily pad to lily pad. And so I feel kind of more suited as a reader and a writer to these shorter forms. Well, the uh, late James Gunn, who just uh, passed away at age 93, uh, wrote uh, one of my favorite essays in one of the short story collections that he um, edited. And in his essay, he talked about, and specifically genre, specifically science fiction, yeah. how a novel is a wonderful walk in the park. You can go anywhere, you can look at that tree, you can go smell that flower. A short story he described as a polished gem. Mm -hmm. There is no facet that is not perfect. There are no unused sentences yeah. or words, no actions take place that deviate from the purpose of that story. Yeah. And I have always appreciated, I have to find that essay again, but I don't know which of the so many books that he edited that was in. I love that. And I was just thinking as you were, you know, I, a friend of mine, Kevin Brockmeyer has a fabulous, fabulous book that just came out, The Ghost Variations. It's a hundred, it's sort of like a jukebox, haunted jukebox. It's a hundred one page ghost stories. Oh, that's great. It's so great. I'll send you a copy. I would love to send you and Barbara a copy because this is a, he is a beautiful writer and every single story has like the shapeliness of a story. And he, I think he thought it was just gonna be a romp. And then he was like, oh my God, I have to do this a hundred times. <laughs> you know, it's like, but there's, his language is like lapidarian. And I asked him kind of what he had learned from doing this. And he said, you know, first of all, it was like the hardest book that he's ever written. But he also said it, when he goes to read other things now, they all feel so bloated to him. You know, they all feel like these saggy monsters because he spent half a decade writing a hundred one page ghost story. So he is so economical. He's so aware every word is like freighted with meaning and you know. Um, so it's true. Then you then you go and you read any novel and you're like, oh my God, what are we doing in this watery cul-de-sac? <laughs> so you since you've written pretty much all lengths, uh, sleep donation is uh, a novella. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure you've written novelettes. Yes. You've written lots of short stories. <clears throat> and you have your novels. You know, so, I will tell you, because my fa people asked me the other day what my favorite of my own work is, which it, like it feels, but, it's embarrassing. It's like your favorite kid. You're not supposed to have one, maybe. Or it's just like embarrassing to rank your own work, whatever. But I will say the story that I felt surprised me in the best way and where I really felt like, um, oh, this is a gift. It was that the title story of St. Lucy's, but also um, Reeling for the Empire. And I'm so proud of that one because that got the Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novelette. Right. And that, you have that hang I mean, it's hanging somewhere. You know, that meant so much to me. Yeah. Um, but it happens like just enough that I think then you're perennially dissatisfied. I don't know if Barbara has this experience where every like once for me, it's sort of like once every 10 years or something, I'll get like a story that feels like a gift. And 
And then the rest of the time, I'm just like, you know. Yeah. Barbara had one story. Now, Barbara has straddled uh, the short story versus novel thing because what she did was she had sold maybe 25, 30 short stories. Yeah. And she wove them, if that's the correct word, into a, um, now I'm blanking, a, a mosaic novel. <laughs> Oh, cool. So, so that the stories, uh, through oh about 180 years or something, oh, followed beautiful. two families. Beautiful. I love mosaic novels. So people now will say a novel in stories or linked stories, but mosaic yeah. is better because it's not so linear, right? It's more things kind of are juxtaposed. It's like an archipelago or something. Yeah, no, right. that's exactly what happens. Is it starts with two young girls in a clearing, one from Germany, one from Russia, but, or Ukraine actually. And uh, they, they meet in that clearing, vow to get together again. Of course that doesn't happen, right. but it happens throughout the years with their descendants wow. until, the, until uh, somewhere in the late 21st century, uh, two women are married and they are each the descendants of two girls from before World War I. So, yeah, there's lots of... So it's almost like elliptical, like planets orbiting, or something, right? You're, yeah. And what's Cage the, what's the Baker, title form of this one? Do you remember? I'm sorry? What's, it, what's the title of the mosaic the, novel? The History of Soul 2065. Okay. And one of the stories in their Sabbath wine was a Nebula nominee. Oh, awesome. And uh, uh, she's turning her hand to, you know, when she's not engineering this and going through all the tourists that we had <laughs> getting the technical part together, she's engineering. Uh, otherwise, she's working on a novel. Oh, man. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for taking time away from your imaginary world to help us <laughs> meet in this one. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm her imaginary world. <laughs> she, and uh, she wishes that maybe it'd be a little more real sometimes. <laughs> but I wasn't going to ask you necessarily what your favorite story was. I was going to ask you what your favorite form is. And you also write nonfiction. Yeah, I love nonfiction. I'm not, um, I don't feel as adept at it, but there's something very liberating about having an assignment. <laughs> and like, um, yeah, I think uh, that was, there are other I, people who are more natural essayists, or, but I really loved, I've gotten to do a few profiles and I've loved those because you sort of, you both get to assert something and disappear in a different uh -huh. way. You know, um, I, I like that a lot, but I think story, I think for me, like, um, Lately, it's been a long, short story, which I think frustrates some readers because it's like you are sort of asking them to build this whole apparatus. You know, it's not like a, an icicle, right? It's like, come on this floating, come on this glacier with me. And you're sort of aware that it's melting underneath you because maybe it's only 17 pages <laughs> of a story. <laughs> but it's sort of, you know, you're inviting them like be, be at home, like form relationships to these characters. And then it's all, you know, so it's, there's something violent about um, that form, maybe. There's something kind of ruthless about it. And it's, as you said, you know, you're aware that you're sort of surrendering to, um, uh, you know, the writer is gonna be trying to transform you in some way and it's gonna happen fast. So I do think there's a kind of ruthlessness about shorter works, but I love it because I, um, especially for speculative stuff, there's a real freedom, you know, there's a, it's a different kind of world building. I loved, I loved Bradbury as a kid and he's the master of this, right? Where it's sort of like, uh, come on down the boardwalk and like, look at all, look at this pocket universe that I've made for you. And like, yeah. come right up to all the stained glass portals. I'm gonna tell you just enough that you can make the world yourself. You know, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of something. I'm gonna wall it off so you can really see it. And maybe it's gonna be so frightening that if you were learning this, on a Wednesday under the spell of your own name, attached to your own history, it would be, you wouldn't let it in, but you can come up here 
and, uh, and we're just going to call it fiction. Um, and so you can disarm whatever sensors would not permit this knowledge into your body. That's mm. how the stories work for me. You know, the ones that I love best. Uh, I was thinking about Aliyah. There's like, she really gets into in one story, the horror of the civil war, the horror of it. And like, you, you feel the, that this past continues to cohabit our present. But when you're like reading an op-ed, sometimes this happens to me, like your body musters an immune response or you, or you feel like some kind, you feel disconnected in some way. And this, because you're making it out of your own materials, it's, it's, it's very scary. So I think like that, um, the th like theme parks, I used to love to write about theme parks. And part of that is just Florida. But part of it is that's what a story can kind of feel like to me. It's sort of like, here's an artificial world, but there's, you know, that Marianne Moore quote where she says, imaginary gardens with real toads in them. It's like you wouldn't be able to approach it maybe in nonfiction in quite the same way. Um, or you wouldn't be like charmed and disarmed in this way that then you're really you're really out of the corner of your eye. You're going to let something in that you you it would be like noonlight. You wouldn't be able to apprehend it otherwise. That's that sounds crazy. I'm now rambling, but I think you know what I mean, right? Like if that's the magic of a story, and you can have these sort of like the president's reincarnated as horses. I mean, that is not that should never be a novel, <laughs> you know? Like God, no. You know what I mean? You can like take but, but it's, wild and make it live for 12 pages that really you wouldn't be able to sustain that, nor should you for the length of a novel. But you can play. You can play around that way too. And that Yeah. I, and I and I also just loved which presidents you chose. Now, here here's a uh, problematic question. If you were to <laughs> rewrite that story today, would you change any of the cast? So many people, to include yourself, I think you've asked me like which horse Trump would be. This is the story called the Barnaby the, of our term. The backside. Bunch of presidents find themselves like reincarnated as horses, and um, you know Kevin Brockmeyer, who I mentioned, he also has yeah. so many stories that are sort of like here's an afterlife where things only become more mysterious. Like no answers are. Mm. You know, it's it's somehow in some ways even more opaque. And I just sort of love the dark joke of that. It's like, oh my God, what if after death, not only does it continue, but it just gets more bewildering. So all mm -hmm. of these presidents, they're sort of stabled and they want to know like, is this heaven? You know, like what's my legacy? Um, but I, I don't know who I would add. I don't like the idea of saddling any any animal with Trump's consciousness. I think like that <laughs> would be for an animal. So I don't, I wouldn't do that to even like a, a Shetland pony, you know? <laughs> yeah. Maybe just a portion of the anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the, the jello hoof or something. I don't know. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, how, how long is uh, the piece you want to read for us? Well, I've been debating this. I could either read two beginnings I feel good about the beginnings. Things get like a little gluier after that. Um, neither of these is published. So I, I feel like I'm just gonna knock on wood that they become something. Or I okay. could do the beginning in the middle of this sleep mask story. Maybe I'll do that. Cause I feel like you'll hear a lot of my, um, a lot of the anxieties of 2020 and 2021 have gotten refracted through this one, I think. Um, okay. Oh, before we do that, I wanted to mention um, since we were talking about uh, the wonderful Eliadon Johnson so much, that if people are watching this on Facebook, and I understand our Facebook live feed may be broken, but we are live on YouTube at the very least, and I will copy it over to Facebook. But it's, if people go to the uh, Nursif Readings Group, New York Review of Science Fiction Readings Group, on Facebook, and scroll down, you will find Alia reading from her new book and singing the song. Amy was the host for that. And you know, I read since we talked, Charles Yu. And yes. I just love him. Oh my God. He was, he, he was oh our guest last month. I love him. Well, speaking of someone who is um, comic and consequential, right? I mean, he is so playful yeah. and I feel like, but he's so, you know, f finds such rich vocabularies for, you know, makes a lot of pointed social political commentary while being so just the have, you, have you thought at all of following some of his um, lead and writing screenplays and teleplays? I wish I could. I, uh, 
I have I no mean, idea. Uh, I, that might not be my my strong you know, that, right now. That he had written the entire uh, first season of Westworld for yes. HBO. Yeah. Isn't that cool? And, I love that. And he wrote what may be my favorite episode of Legion. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was a third season episode, and and he's adapting uh, Interior Chinatown for um, Hulu. That makes sense. That's already green lighted. So, so uh, and that happened before he got the. the uh, in fact, he and I did a radio interview the week before he got the National Book Award. So uh, I guess uh, we we should. So if people go to the years of readings on either my YouTube channel or on Facebook, you can find both yeah. the Charles Yu event and the Elijah John Johnson I'm event. Because I'm yeah, I'm huge, huge fan, huge fan girl of both of those writers over here. Um, also, I didn't know that's how you pronounce. I'm embarrassed not to have known that. Nursif is how you pronounce. Well, <laughs> it's N Y R S F. You know, and how often are we going to say the <laughs> New York, or if you prefer, the New York review of science fiction? <laughs> it's funny you say it that way because my son, out of the clear blue, has developed all these accents. Maybe he's just lonely and he's trying to, you know, but he was like, Mama, go eat your dinner. Like, it's just really like, oh my God. Where did it come from? What, uh, what, what cartoons is he watching? I know, I know. <laughs> it's just like the, the patriarchy surfacing like a galleon. I don't know. Um, right. I, so this is like 20 minutes, but I can read less than that. We'll no, 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 no. 20 minutes is fine. Okay. Um, right. I, uh, uh, and this is not from sleep donation. It is not. So, it's okay. It so we won't it put... something. No, no. But I no, put no. It... The only reason I ask is because if it were, we would put the book cover in the corner while you read. <laughs> but instead, we'll just close out the session with that book cover when we're done. There was a performance at the Grammys. This is like years ago now, but it was like Jay-Z was like sort of like serenading his own image. And it, it just felt, I don't know, it felt like uh, what must be happening inside of us all the time, evicted, you know? <laughs> it was just kind of... Um, sonically battling himself on this big screen. So I mean, I, it's good. I won't. I won't um, read to my own book cover. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I mean, also, and I hope let everybody light a candle for me. I would love if this becomes something. But right now, it's just like straight from the desktop to your ears. And so I appreciate you guys <laughs> taking this risk with me. <laughs> okay, so Fine. if you are ready, uh, I am going to be disappeared. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'm really so honored to be part of this series. And I just love Jim, obviously. And um, yeah, thanks for letting me read something new. I don't do that very often. So um, this is uh, a story about sleep masks. And it's from Sleep Donation, which is a book where there's an insomnia epidemic, a very mysterious epidemic in America. Millions have lost the ability to sleep. And there's a, a the slumber core, which is sort of like a red cross for insomnia. One. Okay, I think you. Ha we have to apologize because I think we are. Ha we have lost the New York Portland connection. Is she still there? No, she's, gone. she's gone. Oh dear. And I don't know if I. Yeah, uh, I have her email. I don't know if I have her phone number. To uh, if anybody watching this does have parents, I 
a whole lot of people have lost signal. Hmm. Okay, well, bear with us, people. And let me... It's a good thing I wasn't using my phone to... Uh, I'll bet the phone number that I've got for Karen is when she still lived in New York. Uh, but I'm going to try calling it anyway. And I'm even going to put it on speakerphone so we can all join in. Yeah, I'm almost back on. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened there, Jim. Is that Yeah, it is. So... I'm so sorry. Give me just one second. I'm jumping back on. Okay. Don't think it was your fault. This software can be wonky. Oh, oh I see. Okay. Well, I, maybe, it's, maybe Amy can tell the people not so easy. And, <laughs> and it, might, it, it might just be an internet issue. Uh, it's Barbara's yeah. guess. And Barbara's usually no. pretty good at guessing these things. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Let me just try on another device. Let me see if that lets me on. Okay. You're right there. Thanks, Jim. Okay. And, oh, I hung up the phone. That's okay. My dear Karen, you haven't changed your phone number in, when did I get that from you? 12 years ago, probably. No, a little less, 10 years ago, when you were last on the radio show. And I had to pick you up at 4 a.m. Uh, but we should tell people you're, uh, we're in our 30th season of the New York Review of Science Fiction Readings. Our next event is in two weeks that Amy will be hosting, and that will be with Alana C. Meyer. And May is not yet booked, and June is going to be A.C. Wise. It's Allison Wise, who has a uh, Peter Pan-related novel coming out about then. And I'm a big fan of variants of uh, Peter Pan. Best one I ever saw was a play called Peter and Wendy that was done by the Mabu Mines, and the, it was mostly puppets and one amazing actress named Karen White. And, uh, yeah. ah, okay. And, oh, hello. Sorry, guys. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and okay, my God, your head got so much. There we go. So Did I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nobody needs. So, nobody needs uh, that extreme close up. Darwin, is it possible at all that the issue was having taken me out of the stream? Okay, if we if we disappear again, I'm yeah. going to go away. Okay. And if and if the thing disappears again. It will have been a technical malfunction of taking me off screen. <laughs> or we just, usually well, happy this when is our haunted, our haunted room. Um, all right, let's see if I can. Okay, so here we go, Karen. Hey, okay, guys. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Uh, you know, no sooner do you start to earnestly talk about dreams than some ghost in a Zoom is like, sayonara, lady, get out of there. So. Maybe that was a sign that I shouldn't do this um, monologue to my own giant face. This is my kitchen. I'm, I hope that you can hear me over the dishwasher. I'm amazed that my kids haven't Zoom bombed us yet. I'm so happy about that. Um, I'll, you know, all the, they're adorable, but woo, it's nice to be reading some fiction to you in the middle of the day alone. Uh, really, that's a rare pleasure to be alone. Um, this is a story about uh, a world where millions of Americans have lost the ability to sleep and there's a red cross for insomniacs. Um, healthy dreamers donate sleep and dreams for those who are afflicted with this. And then the nation's sleep supply becomes contaminated by nightmares. So this is a story, that's the, the premise of sleep donation basically is kind of what does the world look like when sleep has become a commodity and um, dreaming, you know, you can be sort of evicted from your dreams and you can become dependent on a sleep donor, you know, to get you through the nights. 
Um, so this is a little bit further down the road. You know, um, I was imagining still the near future, but let, let's say maybe 10, 15 years after the initial epidemic where now this is just kind of a permanent feature um, of American society is this, uh, this nightmare, these nightmares that are contagious um, and sort of travel around like spores. I don't think it's so distant than what we're seeing today. You know, I was thinking about QAnon, which absolutely feels like a nightmare contagion to me um, and sort of the amplification of, of our technologies, you know, the way that, um, you know, my, you know, we're all connected in this through the great glowing sleepless eye of the internet. Um, and you see sort of some disturbing trends towards surveillance right now. I'm sure that like, you know, big tech is, spying on uh, our conversation and we're all going to get banner ads for sleep masks after I do this reading. So these are these are some of the things that are kind of bouncing around and you'll hear some of those anxieties uh, refracted in this. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. It's, as I said, just a great honor to get to read for the series. Sleep masks. Cleaver eye. The man climbing the low hill wore the scariest smile the girls had ever seen. He was a big man, at least 300 pounds, and yet he seemed to drift through the falling snow with the aimlessness of a feather. A white man with a vanishing islet of reddish hair, wearing only a t-shirt and holy sweats into the drifts. A red leash dangled from his hand, picking up snow as he dragged it behind him. Had his dog gotten free? Could such a man really own a dog? His chapped hands were red as apples and it hurt to look at their torn fingernails. He was older than the girl's mother, younger than their grandfather, with friendly jowls and a powdery goatee, gold like the cattails you could still see poking through the snow. It was a late winter afternoon and Natalia and Isla had entered the park at a diagonal. Their mother had forbidden them from crossing at dusk but walking always felt better than waiting for the bus. Like every other teenager, Natalia knew how to hack her find me settings. Right now, her parents were tracking the progress of an imaginary daughter, a little ember that smoldered at a school desk from seven to three and ran in droning circles around the track with other college bound youths, go tapers, and made a beeline home after practice. Natalia liked to watch her avatar's soothing rotations on the screen while she got stoned with her sister under the bridge. She took a custodial pride in her little ghost, a data point instead of a daughter, two-dimensional, reliable, beating like a gentle heart. As far as their parents knew, she and Isla were both blipping at the bus stop. In the falling dark, on nobody's radar, the stranger turned and locked eyes with them. He was moving his arms like a groggy windmill and Natty realized he was trying not to fall. Mid soliloquy, he approached the girls where they stood gaping in their quilted white parkas. Mine looks like a pillowcase for the moon, mom, Isla had complained that morning. Although as the temperature dropped, she gratefully zipped it above her chin. His voice lifted in urgency and pitch a tea kettle whistle. Tip me over and pour me out. He was almost singing now. Peacock, slapdash, artichoke, yellow, beetle, saint, glacier, secret order of the cobra-footed nuns. The words teetered on the edge of meaning. Both girls shook their heads like swimmers trying to clear their ears. Shut up, Natalia screamed. This was the wrong move. It was as if her cry had roused an older animal inside him. With a predatory snap, the large man grabbed Isla with his naked fingers. He must be freezing, Natty thought, amazed that she could think at all. The wisp of a smile clung to his face, a smile that meant as little as the clouds racing overhead. With a fairy tale step, seven leagues at once or so it seemed to the sisters, the man closed the distance between them. Natalia, who broke track and field records despite skipping most practices, was halfway to the tree line before she realized that her sister had been caught. Fear slid cleanly down her middle, separating her into two people, fighter and flyer, sister 
and traitor. For a terrifying few seconds, the anonymous life hunger was about to win. Run, run, run. And later she'd remember the canary yellow trilling of her heart betraying itself. She paused for long enough to understand there was no safety beyond the trees. The best part of her would not survive the act of abandoning her sister. So it was as much to save herself as to save Isla that she returned to stand under the sick man's waterfalling mouth. Isla was staring dopily up at him, absorbing everything. Cleaver eye, cleaver eye, he sang. Did it relieve his burden to pass on a nightmare? Or was it like a sneeze, a reflex? His body's losing battle against the dream. Was he even aware of what he was saying? With trembling hands, Natalia unpocketed the state-issued earplugs that looked like tiny metal flowers, tried to push one into her sister's ear. She dropped both into a cold dune. Don't listen to him, drown him out. Turn up the volume on your own thoughts. They had drilled what to do in this very emergency at school. If you suspected a stranger was describing a contagious nightmare, you should recite Maya Angelou or the periodic table of elements, words with strong attractions to one another to block the transmission. Her thoughts floated off, petals torn from a shocked green stem and no new thoughts grew to replace them. Into the breach rushed the man's voice. Cleaver eye, cleaver eye, cleaver eye. Natalia could feel the two words taking root. She clapped the back of her neck, wailing, and she saw, or imagined she saw, a bright eye reflected in the lean mirror of the cleaver, interstellar rings around a dilating hole. The color was unstable, vibrating from gold to purple. Whose eye? The eye of what? Not this man's boot leather brown one, not her own. Dream eye that was already dissolving, sinking deeply, irretrievably inside her to the echoing depth. What Isla's body did with these same two words differed from Natalia in unspeakably subtle ways. Her cleaver was wider and bloodier, and the eye was a rabbit pink bead. Was this the eye of a killer or the victim? Above them, the sick man's bare skull was gathering snowflakes. His smile made Natalia think of the grins of alligators, Isla of abandoned fence line. He only escaped because the man stopped talking to Hiccup rolling his bald skull between his hands, the whole head jumping. Cleaver! Oh. <laughs> to uh, fill in some hiccups here for me. I, I wrote them out as hup, 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 but... Um, sorry, that broke, broke the spell a little bit. Uh, Natty tugged Isla's arm free of his grip. Hand in hand, they ran. Neither spoke until they reached the road. And when they turned, the man was a dissolving speck against the tree line. They watched him hitching along, falling, dragging a dead leg after him before rising heavily up again, one hand scuffling at his crotch. He was out of earshot, although the wind might change. Isla kicked at her sister's shins. Come on, Natty, we should report him. We should. How much of that did you catch? Sorry, guys. The sisters were staring at each other in the streetlight's halo. Isla was panting harder than the low hill warranted, tears pooling in her eyes that her sister pretended not to see. None of it, right? Almost nothing. Ernie was on the couch nursing the baby when her daughters walked in with petals of snow still melting in their dark hair. Oh, I was getting worried. Was the bus late? The bus was late, the girls repeated as if stamping a document. Lately, their mother handed out alibis as soon as they walked in the door. She returned to her passionate love affair with the baby and asked no further questions. The baby stared over with huge, luminous eyes. Where was that astral light coming from? There should be a baby in every interrogation room, thought Natalia. She felt certain now that the baby knew everything about the man in the snow, the one who they'd abandoned, escaped. Well, I'm glad you're home. There's a nightmare cluster in Newcastle. Oh, this was exciting. Maybe no school tomorrow then. Where is it projected to hit? Three hours south of here. They all turned to face the home screen. The purple glow turned the living room into a submarine. The nightmare cluster pulsed outward on the nap, 
the anchor wanding over the affected regions. Look, said Isla, it's moving. A little icon appeared over Newcastle. It looked like an eyebrow, a black rainbow. The icons were meant to be an ocular shibboleth. If you'd had the nightmare it represented, the icon would be meaningful to you. You'd know to turn yourself in to the nearest sleep quarantine station for treatment. If not, it was just a glyph. The icon was a leering reminder that not everybody wore a mask to sleep. And the slumber core's algorithms did not catch everything, of course. The percentage of contagious nightmares that missed detection was allegedly less than one or something like that, 0. 0.0000, extremely low anyhow, according to guess who, the slumber core. What were the odds of getting accidentally pregnant at 40, Natalia wondered, higher or lower than your chances of dying from a nightmare? Plenty of people judged their mom for getting knocked up in middle age. Even their Catholic grandmother had grimaced. But nobody asked Natalia, hey, are you furious at your mother for being such a horny klutz? Instead, everybody cooed and said, do you just love the baby so much? Well, of course. The baby's legal name was Berenice, a family name exhumed by their mom, the tombstone marker of a great, great stranger. Isla, holding pot smoke in her lungs, exhaled insights of dubious value, such as, whoa, when you die, your tombstone becomes your address, your cemetery P.O. box. Berenice sounded like a grizzly bear with a rose gold Victorian comb sunken into her fur. Nobody could say it with a straight face. Was it weird to become a big sister at 17? Her best friend wanted to know. No weirder than watching one semi-nude mom rolling around the carpet with a tiny stranger. No weirder than an entity they'd all agreed to call Berenice showing up in a bloody towel one night, wearing a purple felt rosebud and their mother's face. No, not really, she lied. Uh, it's nice, I like helping out with the baby. Lately, Natalia had grown to almost enjoy their walks together. A 16 year age gap made for some interesting conversations. Q, are you the nanny? A, I'm her sister. Ernie hadn't looked at the home screen once since they'd arrived. Her left breast was still mashed in the baby's mouth. My sister, Natalia thought dully, watching it suck. It was hard not to think of the baby as a kind of external brain tumor that had transformed their mother into this weird lullaby stranger. Oh, Isla, Ernie was really looking at them now. Honey, you're bleeding. They all stared at the welling line on her sister's wrist and even the baby was staring. Natalia felt ashamed she hadn't noticed earlier. Had something snagged them on their flight from the park? Doesn't hurt mommy. Mommy? Natty raised an eyebrow, not their usual form of address. Ernie, the poor dope, smiled at her daughters. Mommy, I think I'm coming down with something. Sinewy clock, rick rock, rick rock. A man's eye slivered like the moon, flat icicles against the checkered green kitchen tiles, knives hanging blade down from a magnetic strip. Hey, you guys, I was not planning this, but there you have it. That's what these girls are seeing in their privacy while they consider whether or not they caught a nightmare in the park. So what? So a little bit of what he said did dribble into me. That doesn't mean I'm gonna dream about it. Natalia traced the simple, inscrutable icon on the home screen, and behind her, Isla exhaled. Not an eyeball, she said. Not a cleave. Shut up. Remember? We didn't hear anything. But there are processes that you can't halt. A pupil widening to swallow light. A mind interpolating familiar shapes into the dark. Thousands of tiny vibrations hammering your eardrum, exploding into meaning. The baby went to bed first while it was still light out. Isla helped Ernie to give her a bath in the sink while Raymond and Natalia watched like jilted lovers from the living room. An unlikely alliance had developed between Natalia and her father Raymond in the past year as Ernie seemed to drift out of earshot of their voices into a frightening new happiness some animal song audible only to her mother and the baby. The baby 
didn't seem to like Raymond much yet, and it howled whenever it was separated from Ernie. Natalia watched her mom push the baby's fat legs through pajama pants covered in tiny green and pink discs, watermelon print, maybe alien moons. The baby's drawers were overflowing with gifts. An entire wardrobe had appeared months before the baby herself. The baby shower had felt like a game show with a hysterically applauding audience and no contestants. Prize after prize stacking up under balloons tied to an empty high chair. Oh boy, guys, I'm sorry. This is just, this is the, the blooper reel. Um, I can't, you know what, Jim? I can't hear you. Oh, no. Unmute me, please. Gotcha. Okay, there we go. Okay, so yeah, life intervenes. Life intervenes. Yes, and we have a 13-month-old next door, and uh, sometimes I'll be recording in the middle of the night to make things quiet, <laughs> but she will join me, um, although she's usually very polite, but she's being 13 months, she's just discovered the bouncing ball. Oh, no. And so... Yeah, it, it, it'll it'll be interesting. Hopefully, I won't have to pre-record every radio show and event. Well, I thank future. you guys for your patience. I mean, it is the Zoom time, you know. But I was happy to give the knives, my kitchen knives, a cameo. Um, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, 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 where do you want to go? Do you want to continue the story? I'll, I'm. What if I just finish this page? I see a good stopping place. What if I get to like a little plateau? Okay. Uh, is that okay? It'll take like two minutes, if that. Not even. Fine. Okay. I'm All right. I'm back, guys. We're just going to get to like a, a good stopping place for the cool down with Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this sister, she's 16 and it's confusing. She's 17. It's confusing to become a big sister. Her mom got accidentally pregnant at 40. Um, and that sort of, you know, revolutionized the dynamics of their household. And now she's in a little bit of a pocket of neglect. And um, you know, teenagers, there's some strange kamikaze music playing inside them sometimes. Um, and I think these two daughters, you know, they think they might've been infected with a nightmare. Um, and they're, instead of sort of turning themselves in, they're just interested to see, you know, their mother got accidentally knocked up and had this baby. So maybe a little bit, you know, at least the older sister's kind of thinking, well, what is this going to become inside me? You know? You turned your accident into our destiny. I want to see what I can grow in my privacy if I if this is a nightmare. There's sort of an ambivalent um, thing going on there. And so I'm thinking about it anyways. Um, Ernie slid the tiny sleep mask on the baby. Dreaming under the same roof was dangerous if she and Isla had been exposed in the park. It meant their sister was also at risk. Natalia felt badly that she didn't feel worse. What did babies have to dream about anyhow? How could a newborn already be vulnerable to nightmares? For some reason, it felt equally absurd to imagine infecting their parents. If her mother barely registered what she said out loud, Natalia didn't see how something as private as a dream could leap between their bodies. Natalia and Isla belonged to the first generation that had never dreamed alone. For nearly 20 years, the government issued sleep masks had been mandatory. From babyhood on, they'd been bludgeoned with lessons on civics and sleep hygiene. Why it's important to sleep with a mask. We dream together. You're only as sick as your secrets. How nightmare contagions spread. Upload your dreams to the cloud bank. It's the law. In the dark ages before their births, when nightmare contagions first began to sweep the nation, Ernie and Raymond had kept dream journals. Isla had once flipped through a stack of them in the basement Backing away from the word pussy in her dad's antiquated cursive, her mother's description of a prom court of box turtles. Who were these strangers, the parents? Impossibly, only 20 years earlier, the Slumber Corps Dream Database had relied on the butter churn of data collection, self-reporting. People turned out to be very unreliable narrators of their own nightmares, Raymond had told them in his podium voice. We are safer now, but something vital was lost. Keeping the dream journals, 
combing the beach for those fragments every morning. They'd heard some version of this lecture a thousand times. Their dad's invitation to a nostalgia for the world before the masks and the uploads, the cloud bank that stored every taxpayer's dreams. It was a world they'd never experienced, and so they could no sooner mourn for it than they could respond to their grandmother in fluent Spanish or feel homesick for the bulldozed world of her blue house in Cienfuegos, Cuba, or convincingly curse the bones of Fidel Castro. Natalia and Isla could only disappoint these adults who expected such performances for them. Back then, nobody relied on scans. Your other lives had only you to reassemble them. Your dreams had only you to remember them. Raymond taught seminars on the history of dream interpretation in four different departments at three rival colleges. Your father is a disciplinary adulterer, explained Ernie in the jokey voice that still echoed with whatever distant first flirtation had resulted in their three children. He's a romantic, your silly dad. Giving Raymond shit was also a family pastime. And you guys slept without masks, even grandma. Your grandma would drink a tankard of gin and fall asleep buck naked on the rug under the coffee table. Nobody had any idea what grandma was dreaming about under there, least of all me. We all did that then, said Ernie. It seemed very normal at the time. Sleep masks did not exist. The generation before ours took baths in mercury. They powered their vehicles with diesel, okay? Wireless masks, a triumphant innovation of the last half decade, let you fall asleep anywhere, resting easy, knowing your dream feed was going directly to the cloud bank. No civilian understood what happened beyond, behind the Oz curtain of the algorithm. Not their parents, certainly. Two humanities majors who could not even explain how the ice dispenser worked. Machine learning algorithms helped the government sleep doctors to flag any potential, potentially contagious nightmare. Every morning, a flag was appended to your scan, green or red. Red meant a possible infection. By the time they were preschool age, the girls had seen dozens of classmates shuttled off to the sleep doctors for medicine to suppress a burgeoning nightmare. Raymond would scowl, his whole face wrinkling into the old paternal sun shower. People catch colds all the time, don't they? It doesn't mean you're bad if you get sick, girls. Yet this message was undermined every morning at the breakfast table when Ernie and Raymond exhaled with relief at the green flags pinned to their daughter's brain scans. Looks like everybody had excellent dreams last night, Ernie would beam around the table. A good dream was dawn soluble. Sunlight erased it. It wouldn't infect anybody else. A bad dream, a red flag dream, had the power to escape your body and multiply darkly through the wider population. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Sort of feels like what we're living already, you know. I was going to say just that, is that how speculative was that fiction? Yeah, totally. Simply, yeah. You know, we're not, it's sort of like documentary realism if you come at it from another. <laughs> yes, right. We're, we're, we're not uploading our dreams per se, but we're certainly... Uh, uh, All of our other communications are being surveilled, right? And we're sort yes. of volitionally, we're sort of volitionally tithing so much of our lives to the cloud. You know, I think it's really wild. It makes 1984 seem so quaint. Like <laughs> it's uh, it, it's as if 1984 were almost 30 years ago. Oh wait, it was. Yeah. But, but. <laughs> I mean, that's what's amazing to me is that we're not like rioting in the streets. In a way, you know, I mean, I sort of uh, the, the term <laughs> is just to yeah, live in this world, or so well, we are, we are in Portland, we are. But I mean, around around some of this, the, the issues about privacy and security, you know. Um, yeah, well, uh, there there is a lot of that going on, certainly coming to Congress at this point. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, and just on those issues of privacy. So uh, I agree with some, disagree with others. It's a, it's a mess. It's a mess. But um, it seems that dreams or dreamlike state is pervasive in a lot of your fiction. Yeah, I think so. Well, I was thinking a little bit about what a sanctuary and how terrifying also dreams are, right? It's the very honest communication 
it's maybe yeah. the most honest communication a body can have with itself, you know, where the gutter guards are down, you know, you're, you're not, you, the, the, all of the genie bottles come unstoppered and you learn something whether you want to or not. <laughs> right. And I think when you surrender to a book, it's about as close to like a lucid dream as anything else in this life, right? That's what you're doing. You're sort of, now you're gonna, on the player piano of your own body, you're gonna make up the author's dream. So I think so, something about that parallel, I also love. But I do think, you know, you see how the advertisers are, they're already siphoning, you know, anytime I, I promise after this conversation, I'll pick up my phone and there'll be a, rec a record of it in the form of advertising. So sleep and dreams now also feel like a sanctuary to me in that respect. Yeah. Like the yeah. so, so the far, touch, you know, you're off the clock, you're off that clock. Okay, so here's a frightening phrase, product placement in dreams. <laughs> right it's coming you know they want to do it you know zuckerberg has a team somewhere who's like okay you know like jim's been dreaming about <laughs> you know, the beaches. let's get him some some you know pamphlets uh that he can download in there you don't know yeah uh we we are mentioning and it's been on the screen in fact that it's a good time for people to um ask questions in the chat channel now, the only chat channel we have working at this point is on the YouTube site because the Facebook site hasn't worked. What we've done is we've copied the YouTube site yeah. to Facebook. So oh, people okay. go to where your reading is supposed to be, they click, and they get taken to YouTube. So if assuming you're on YouTube, type in your questions and comments, and uh, they will get transmitted to us. Uh, Amy, by the way, Amy Goldschlager, who is uh, looking for those questions, pointed out that they they had the thing with the dreams in Futurama and also the, the parallel kind of stuff to uh, uh, WandaVision. Oh, I need to see WandaVision. I haven't seen you, it yet. You do. You do. I WandaVision is uh, sort of an amazing show. And you, it helps if you know you're Marvel, but it doesn't matter if you don't. Oh, good. Okay. You Especially know, I, in the, uh, I was, with sleep and dreams. I don't know if you, this is like a St. Lucy story um, that I wrote when I was like a like a baby. I now realized, but it was called uh, ZZ Sleepaway Camp for Disordered Dreamers, and it oh was my. each of the you know you would just bunk down in a different cabin. So there was like a cabin for bedwetters, a cabin for insomniacs, a cabin for people that, you know, sleepwalkers, <laughs> they just, all of the different ways that you can, um, things can go awry in the night. Right. Which now what we have uh, one comment and uh, one question. So I'll start with the comment first and then go to the question because that, that was sort of volley. The comment comes from uh, Jonathan Gladstone Gelman. And he said, wow, that didn't go where I thought it would. I hope this story sees print. Great title and concept. And I think that speaks for itself. Thanks, John. Thank you. And uh, Jim Ryan says, as this is a very deep topic with lots of facets, could this story possibly become a novel someday? Oh, I, you know, I, I am. Um, one of the challenges for me is that it's already, the DNA feels bigger than like a, a truly short story to me. So mm. I thought the answer is, to, I'm at this weird place where it feels like playing the accordion badly. I honestly don't know if the answer is to sort of tighten the focus and stick with this one sister who's incubating this nightmare, or if it's, you know, a mosaic. I don't know. I really don't know. I do sort of think um, this doesn't feel so distant from the reality we're living, as Jim and I were saying. So it, no. whatever happens with this particular piece of fiction, I was happy to have a place to go with my terror. <laughs> <laughs> like try to alchemize it into something. Because I think about my kids too. You know, I think about the kind of world they're inheriting and they're so, um, already they're so addicted to screens. They live such a screened off world, particularly during this pandemic, right? Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, John uh, commented or asked, would it be fair to say uh, that this story was inspired by pandemic confinement? 
Probably. I, play, I mean, I had been living in this universe of sleep donation again a little bit because this book was reissued. It's something that I novella I wrote in 2014, you know, a long time before our actual actual pandemic. So it has a different, I have a different relationship to it now. But then I started sort of, I was, I did an event with Jim. I was doing these readings and I was kind of back in that mind space. And also as those of you who are parents of young children know, you spend a lot of your life wandering around at 4 a.m. If you <laughs> like these little, <laughs> I mean. That's yeah. where I used, to, when I was on from yeah, 5 to 7 a.m. That's lot. where my, that's where my listeners came from. Distraught parents. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's got to be a huge swath of your listeners because everyone's so grateful, you know, to have a friendly voice at that hour. Um, yeah. Thoughts become yeah. something else, you know, at 4 a.m. They're, they're yeah, not but now, now I'm on at 7 a.m. I start at 7 a.m., which is daylight hours. Yeah, that's after, after all these years. Yeah. And I do have to boast, by the way, last month was – if you're ready for this, the 50th anniversary of Hour of a Wolf. Oh. Five zero years. That's for me, only 48 is host. Uh, Margot Adler did the first two years. That's amazing, but Jim. That's a long time. It really is. That's, it that's, really is. That's, that, the, the show is like a happily haunted house then. Or I don't <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think it may be. Sometimes I take a look at uh, the various people. Uh, Jessica Goldberg asks, is it going to stay YA appropriate? Wondering how scary the story is oh, going to get. I, I have to say, imagining those two words, for some reason, cleaver eye, why does that, it's, it really scared me and I don't really know what it means. That was just like a little snatch that got stuck in my own head. Um, but I, I think it probably will not get uh, you know, it's it's not going to be like a Paul Tremblay, Stephen Graham joke. <laughs> scary. I don't. You ratchet it back a few from that. So, you know, so I think we're going to be like a Kelly Link on Candy Zone. I I don't know that it's going to kick into like Paul Tremblay ritual murder zone. Right. <laughs> said, said the woman looking over at her Shirley Jackson award. Yeah. As I, well as I like show you guys on my, I'm like I don't know. Yep. Yeah. There. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and, and I consider Shirley Jackson's stories to be very possibly the scariest. Bone there are. chilling. Bone chilling. Oh, I was just and, reading Paranoia. Have you read that in recent years? Oh. Uh, which one? Paranoia. No. Oh, my God. Oh, but they're all, um, she, she's truly amazing. I, I feel like she's having a little bit of a renaissance right now. It's exciting. She is. I'm very pleased. There was, um, mm -hmm. I mean, aside from this reimagining of Hill House, which Barbara and I didn't get too far in, but we saw a recent new production, uh, came out about a year ago, I think, of We Have Always Lived in This Castle. Oh. And it's wonderful. brilliant. It's really, really good. It's on one of the um, uh, streaming channels, either Amazon or uh, uh, Netflix. It's 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 not on Disney Plus. Let's put ah. that. Um, uh, although there's nothing that Disney Plus could show would just scare the bejesus. <laughs> Of all the kids, but hey, Disney, you see, there Disney is exactly who would use these sleep masks to advertise to you in your dreams. They're exactly who would fund all this research so they could be like, Here's our impoverished fantasy, and and Disney ride our so ride he, all the time, you know, ride our rides at 4 a.m. He had, uh, just like so many uh tellers of uh household tales, Disney had no problem scaring the bejesus out of his uh, kitty audience. You know, think of the Adventureland in Pinocchio. Oh, that's true. That's and, true. And, uh, the uh, Pink Elephants on Parade. There are things in Snow White that are rather scary. And of course, Sleeping Beauty and all that. But I come from a uh, German background and uh, German Jewish. And uh, my parents had, they, they loved, the Teal Eulenspiegel stories, 
which are pretty severe. Mm. Uh, and Richard Strauss wrote a uh, tone poem slash opera of that. But the book that scared the bejesus out of me and was intended somewhat for kids wa was uh, Struvel Pater, otherwise known as Shock Headed Peter. And mm. it is one of the, uh, Google it, Shock Headed Peter. Because um, I wouldn't know how to spell it in the German. Um, and it is scary stuff. Yeah. Well, you can't <laughs> underestimate kids' appetite for that. You know, they know this is like, they know they're in a predatory reality and that they're interested to see that reflected back. <laughs> My son, has yeah. said, he wants like gruesome stories, you know, and fairy tales oblige. <laughs> yeah. So, geez, just looking at the time and not counting our time out. Uh, we've been at this about a hundred minutes now. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I will be, um, I'll be so sad when we don't have this to look forward to on the calendar. This was really like holding time in place, you know? <laughs> yeah, really but on the other hand, you and I can just nice record day. some more. And we can yeah. just put them up, and then, uh, although then we won't have the, uh, um, the Q&A, which, by the way, Jim Ryan tells us that we have always lived in this castle is on Netflix. Oh, okay. Gotta check so it out. see, it is useful to have the audience out there. Audience, if you guys have ideas, you know, I was just rereading Black Hole. Do you know that book, Jim? The, that's a graphic novel by Charles Burns. No, I don't. Oh, it's so good. But I, you know where you sort of source some of your influences belatedly? This is a book where a bunch of kids, it's almost like an STD. They all like pass around. Uh, they, they start to turn into like these freakish animals in the woods. Um, and it's like a, it's a, it's a kind of contagion, um, sexually transmitted um, disaster. And I was, it's so, what's so great about it is it somehow is like, it's like a hologram you can toggle. So you're either reading a true nightmare or you're just like, yeah, that's what it felt like to be 15, man. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's a little like Linda Berry's cruddy that way, you know, where it's either psychedelic <laughs> horror or it's just like a year of your life when you were 16. Um, yeah. Amy says she's got it and that, uh, she thinks it was from like about 2005. Yeah, it's great. But I sort of think like percolating and that, that must have been, that's one of the sort of unsung, that's part of the family tree of this thing that may or may not become published. Yeah, I, I have two areas in which I'm totally ignorant and shouldn't be given my position as somebody trying to bring uh, speculative fiction to the masses over yeah. radio and stuff. But I've read very few graphic novels and seen very little anime. Yeah, I'm. I that's a blind spot for me too. That's a blind yeah. spot for me too. I've seen like kind of the big mainstream stuff, but not the deep. Yeah. Depth. And uh, uh, however, I've been enjoying TV shows based on graphic novels, like. Um, uh, Amy is saying that you should see Paprika. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks, Amy. I'll check it out. Uh, but the... the uh, see, I told you don't look at the chat screen. I'm looking at the chat screen. Uh, yes, some of our preferred TV shows of late, especially the streaming shows, we're catching up with Doom Patrol. Uh, oh, I haven't based seen on that the vertigo. Yeah. It is so I've heard great things. Oh, yeah, my neighbor is, is telling me it's really good. Okay. It is truly bizarre. How many I cannot name too many pieces of fiction that feature a gender queer street named Danny, <laughs> who's one of the major characters of at least a few episodes in the story. Yeah. So uh, it really is. And uh, that along with um, the Umbrella Academy, mm -hmm. which is, again, very bizarre and actually has some shared DNA with uh, Doom Patrol. Uh, Gerard Way, I believe his name is, worked on both. Oh, cool. Okay. And, well, I'm always uh, looking for new good new stuff to check out. Yeah, and what I didn't know is that Doom Patrol, one of the authors of the comic, 
was a friend of ours, Rachel Pollack. And I knew that she'd worked on some comic, but there we go. This is what so, I'm talking about. You're like, wow, I've been watching her dream. I've been dreaming her dream all this time. And I didn't even, you know, it's, it's a, <laughs> it they, makes it so cozy and round. Um, yeah. And she's an expert in tarot, which has a lot of fun. Um, Jessica says, so the shared dreams in the sister's reality is a new form of mass communication. It, it, I love that, Jessica. I love it's, that. It's uh, the new Wikipedia. <laughs> I love the it. Wiki, I was the Wiki dream. Imagining, you know how teenagers, you just want to fly under all kinds of radars when you're at that age, like to become a person. You really need to find a good pocket of neglect or pocket of privacy. And I was thinking when I was a kid, you know, you could disappear a little bit. Like, I mean, I, now I'm, this is more information than anyone wants or needs, but really I could disappear for whole weekends. You, we had landlines. Nobody really knew where you were, and that that feels to me like a a freedom that is going extinct. You know, yeah. Um, I, and I, and, I, and I noticed you know, that. inside yourself, though. There, that is still a kind of trespass. Like reading for me. Remember, like my, you know, other kinds of. You know, my parents did set limits, some limits, but like books at the library, they were just so happy I was reading anything. So, yeah. I mean, I went to some weird ass places. <laughs> you know, it was like. A uh, very it was like a sanctioned trespassing, and so I think a dream is is um the idea of these sisters. It makes sense to me that they would want to find a crawl space where they could dream under the radar, you know, and just see what that dream becomes, even if it's yeah. even if it's dangerous. And uh, in and in and of itself, that is a wonderful dream. Uh, it would make a very interesting uh, VR presentation. Yeah. Yeah. People, you know, could go through the augmented reality of the dream and pretend to be one of the sisters. <laughs> I think like, you know, I think another thing I find a little terrifying that seems possible that we'll see in our lifetimes is that these there will just be these neuroengineered experiences exactly like that, you know, where people will. I've, I've been reading this spooky um, uh, philosopher, Thomas Metzinger who has a book called The Ego Tunnel that's terrifying. And it's just Ooh. his projection. He's kind of a futurist. But one of the things that he, he's like, you know, we're going to get so good at this that we're going to just offer neuro experiences tailored to your, you know, your gym's particular consciousness. I don't know, guys. And, it, and it's so different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Abandoning yourself to a dream, you know? It's much safer in a way, right? So It is. It is. Uh, well, we need to start signing off, and you and I are going to do this. We're going to find an excuse to do this or something similar again real soon now, right. because now that we've reconnected, I'm not unconnecting. Yeah, keep me in the Rolodex. And oh, Barbara, yeah. check out Barbara's novel, and you guys have to check out Kevin Brockmire, okay? Yes. Uh, uh, I, the name is familiar, and, and I, I have uh, put a little... Uh, yeah, Rock Martin. Yeah, I know you and Aliyah go way back, but that yeah, Aliyah and Charles, man, I'm on a big, I'm on a bender. I'm on an Aliyah yeah. bender. Well, you, well, well, you have to find her reading and her music yeah. uh, on Facebook, uh, or for that matter, I do believe I have it on YouTube as well, uh, in the New York Review of Science Fiction section. Actually, on YouTube, it's under my name. Okay. You just go to Jim Freund and videos, and that's where you and she and Charles you. Oh, there you All go. The great the out there. Yeah, sometimes technology is great. Like that's cool that I get to be in the <laughs> um, yeah. side of space with them. <laughs> and, and and I have the recording, yeah. not the video, but I have the recording of your reading from 2008. Oh my gosh. I recall that as being like a I had a questionable haircut at that time, but maybe that's how I'll feel about. That's surely how I, I feel about this wolfy pandemic time as well. I I, ha I have some photographs. I will see. Oh them. no. <laughs> oh. So uh, we're going to close with a question from Jessica, which I would have asked, but um, she did. So let me credit her. She says, "What's the latest story of Karen's that we can buy?" Oh. Thank you, Jessica. And Barbara, you can put the uh, book cover up. 
Yeah, this would be the latest. There's there was a story collection called Orange World that I I feel oh, like yeah. pretty proud of. And then this no, but this is this is this was reissued by Vintage, and there are these amazing illustrations in it now that I feel like you guys will love. This Ale and Ale, these Italian artists who somehow yeah, you'll get to see their own nightmarish um, imagining inside this book. And I just finished. Yeah. A, a story about a pregnant unicorn. I've always wanted as an adult woman to write a story about a unicorn, an earnest story. My son was like, is it for kids? I mean, he clearly thought I was making a mistake. <laughs> but it's like, you, you guys know conjunctions? I love them. Um, there are a lot of wonderful weirdos in this journal. It's a small journal, but they're it's consistently excellent. It's out of Bard College. So keep an eye out for their 40th anniversary issue because it's going to have like... I have I have heard of it. Oh, you would love the people. I mean, I, you know, I, obviously I'm biased, but um, yeah, Carmen, a lot of people were first published there. Um, William Volman and Carmen Maria Machado and others. So. Yeah. Uh, well, are you in touch with those people? I'm a little bit in touch with Carmen. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, with Carmen, yes, so am I. But with the conjunctions people, maybe we could do an event. Oh, yeah. That might yeah. be fun. Let's brainstorm something. I, I would love that. Count me in. This is okay, so you, so you and I will talk off air about this in the next week or so. Yeah. And in the meantime, everybody out there, uh, yeah, it's okay to get sleep donation, but it's also okay to get Orange World, and name some of the other books. I would love, I feel like poor Orange World, it, it's paperback, came out during the pandemic. I couldn't do a lot for it. So if you guys were looking to buy one thing, I would I would be so grateful. Um, and Sleep Donation too. it got this cool second life in print. It was originally just this digital novella and then it like dispersed like a dream. So I think, I think you'll like it. And it's in multiple <laughs> editions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so those two. And where, where do people find your nonfiction? Oh, um, if you just Google my name, it's going to come up. And I haven't written that much of it. There's a profile about a one-eyed matador. Um, yeah, well, now, now where was that one? I was unbelievable. I was so proud of this, Jim, because I it was in the best American sports writing. <laughs> Whoa! That's a little bit of a stretch. But it was in GQ originally. Okay. And that was, I mean, that was a really intense reporting process. As you might have imagined. And that's also an interesting <laughs> idea of uh, you being in GQ. But the first place I encountered you was the New Yorker. And, yeah. you know, what, what a start. <laughs> well, head over there. Yeah, they, a lot of that stuff is free online, too. So also don't pay yeah. to spend any money. People are, this is a hard time. <laughs> so Yeah, so huh. it is. And I'd like to thank uh, Jessica and other people who have uh, donated during this. Um, mm -hmm session and karen we are going to see you or hear you or do something with you real soon thank you guys thank you so much I'm wishing you all safety and ease and all and and beautiful dreams Happy okay <laughs> thank you all right thanks so let me just barbara, amy. yeah that's what i was going to do now thank barbara for engineering amy for fielding the questions and being the dog body, that, that's the phrase she likes. Um, big, um, much ado about nothing fan, I take it. And uh, we are dog's body. Yes, pardon. <laughs> uh, Amy correcting me in the chat channel, as per usual. Um, so thank you, Barbara and Amy. And we're back in two weeks with Amy as host. For Alana C. Meyer, M-Y-E-R, who's a wonderful writer. And we're still working on the May event. The June event is A.C. Wise, Allison Wise, who has a new novel, Peter Pan-related novel coming out. So we're going to tie into that. And in either August or September, Michael Bishop. Yeah. So, and... Uh, I've had him on the radio, but I've never had him on one of the uh, uh, on one of the things. Uh, Amy says, "No, it's from Blackadder," and Diana Wynn Johnson. I think Shakespeare might have also. 
referenced it, but. <laughs> okay, once again, Karen Russell, thank you so much. Yeah, happy Passover, happy Easter. Thank you, good Pesach to you. And, and you guys Easter. next time, don't dream about cleavers. All right, bye guys. Okay, bye-bye, good seeing you.